is there something special about the real number system that is necessary for us in order to define continuous functions. When you look at the definition of how we think about continuity, it has something to do with taking the absolute values of the differences between two numbers and then comparing that absolute value to epsilons and deltas, right, in our definition of, of continuous. Is there a way for us to talk about continuity that doesn't make reference to those really special things like absolute values, which in more general settings, we might not even know what absolute value is supposed to mean if we're not looking in the real numbers. And even something as simple as subtraction. I know how to subtract two real numbers, but I might not know how to subtract, I don't know, two colors or two um, animals or two, two other kinds of objects which might still live in a space of objects that we would like to be able to have continuous functions on. So do we need arithmetic? Do we need absolute value or some way to measure sizes and distances in order to speak of continuity continuous functions in a coherent way. In the next couple videos, I want to try to convince us that the answer is no. That continuity is not something that requires arithmetic or even requires us to, to know sort of how to measure distances. Right? Continuity is a topological property. We should be able to define what it means for a function to be continuous just by defining what we mean for sets to be open sets. This video is going to be the first step in that process. I want to look at our definition of continuous functions on the real numbers and reformulate it out of the real number context into something that's going to get us into sets instead of into real numbers. So what do I mean by that? So we'll start by just taking a critical look at our definition of what it means for a function to be continuous at a point. f is continuous at x0 if any epsilon that you choose for me in other words, however close you would like for the y values of some points to be to the value of f of x naught. So you pick an epsilon for me, you set a target, you set the, the height of this purple strip on the y-axis. And whatever epsilon you give me, I should be able to find a delta, I should be able to find a vertical green strip, a piece of the x-axis, such that all of the y values of the x values that are within delta of x naught will be within epsilon of f of x naught. But there's some things about this definition that are somehow, they look sort of special and particular to the real number system. And the biggest thing that leaps out to me is the presence of these absolute value symbols. Because what these are doing for us, the function that they're serving in our definition, is that they're giving us a way to measure size and distance, right? Every time I use the word close, and I've probably used it like 67 times in the last couple of videos talking about continuous functions, every time we use the word close, we're speaking about some comparison of distances. And so absolute value in the real number line is how we measure the distance between two real numbers. Um, but not just absolute value, we also need some notion of subtraction. Right? If I'm measuring the distance between x and x0, what I'm doing is first subtracting x minus x0, so that requires some kind of arithmetic, and I'm also taking an absolute value. So we have some notion of size, magnitude, distance, largeness or smallness. Right? And so that feels like geometry. That feels like arithmetic. And those feel like chains to me. Um, that I would like to know that we're defining something that is not that particular. I want to be able to do continuity, continuous functions, if all we know how to work with are sets of some kind. So how do we build a more flexible kind of definition for continuous function that doesn't rely on arithmetic, that doesn't rely on geometry, but that can be purely topological, have something to do with sets, and in particular, open sets. So to do that, Let's just take these inequalities and sort of ask once again, what are we really doing with these inequalities? What purpose are they serving in our definition? And can we sort of reformulate these inequalities into some statement about sets instead? And the good news is we have the language to do that. In particular, we're speaking of the x values that are within delta distance of x naught. And so we're speaking of the members of the set of all points on the real number line, which for which absolute value x minus x naught is less than delta. And then the same thing in this uh, predicate here. We're speaking of all of those real numbers f of x that are within an epsilon's distance of f of x naught. So we're speaking of all the members of the set of real numbers for which that number minus f of x naught in absolute value is less than epsilon. But these we've seen before. These are the open neighborhoods, open neighborhoods in a sort of topological sense, um, around the points x naught and f of x naught respectively, with radius, delta, and epsilon, respectively. So when we use these inequalities, what we're really speaking about is we're speaking about the membership of x and respectively f of x in the open neighborhoods 
around x0 and f of x0, respectively, whose radius is delta or epsilon, respectively. So we can just reformulate these pieces of the definition. So that the new definition reads, f is continuous at x0 if, for all epsilon, there is a delta, such that, for all x in my set E, if x belongs to the delta ball around x0, then f of x belongs to the epsilon ball around f of x0. So now we've gotten the absolute values and the subtraction and the, you've even got the sort of inequality signs here out of the mix, and we're sort of now just speaking about sets. And the good part about that is that if we change our definition at some point, if it's necessary for us to think more expansively about what are open neighborhoods, right? This definition can still be transported directly across. This definition becomes topological because if you tell me what the open neighborhoods are, the balls, right? then I don't have to worry about these details. I'll just use this more general definition. The only other thing that I want to sort of bring across here is this if-then logic, because right? this also feels like it bears some relationship to sets. So it's saying if x belongs to the delta ball, then f of x should belong to this epsilon ball. And that if-then feels like it ought to be some sort of a statement about subsets. And it can be if we just remember how we define images of sets and inverse images of sets. It's one of the first things that I like to talk about in first semester real analysis. It's just bringing back that language of what is the image of a set under a function? What is the inverse image of a set under a function? And so when we take all of that and we transport it into a definition, it ends up reading like f is continuous at x0. If for all epsilon there exists a delta such that anytime x belongs to the delta ball around x0, so any point that's in this set, will also have the property that f of x belongs to the epsilon ball around f of x0. And so to turn this green thing here into a statement about x instead of into a statement about f of x, we'll just remember what the inverse image of a set under a function is defined to be. The inverse image of a set is the set of all points in the domain for which f of x belongs to the set in question. And so if f of x belongs to the epsilon ball around f of x0, that means that x belongs to the inverse image of this epsilon ball. So reading it from left to right, if x belongs to the delta ball around x0, then x must belong to the inverse image of the epsilon ball around f of x0. So we just sort of bump that f of x down here, and it becomes an inverse image instead. So now it's saying, if x belongs to this set, then x belongs to that set. And so that's why what we actually have is a subset relationship. So now I have a definition right here of what it means for a function to be continuous, and it only speaks about inverse images, which are purely a function and set theoretic idea, and it speaks of epsilon balls and delta balls, which we can define in various other ways besides the way that we've defined them in the real line with the standard topology. Right? So what we get here is a new kind of definition that is going to be much easier to understand, much easier to recognize when we see it in other contexts as well. And the last thing I want to say for this clip is that notice that it's actually inverse image that we used here to define what it means for a function to be continuous. And that's going to be meaningful later on. Because when we see continuity in the more general context, continuity is going to be defined in terms of inverse images. In particular, the main result that we're going to have a handful of videos from now is that continuous functions, wherever we see them and in whatever mask that they try to wear, continuous functions are those for which the inverse images of open sets are still open sets. That's going to be the most general idea for what it means for a function to be continuous. As long as we know and we agree upon what open set means, then we automatically get an idea of what continuous functions are. Continuous functions are those for which the inverse image of every open set is an open set. And so this is sort of the first clue to why it is that that's going to happen, uh, where the role of open set here, the surrogates for open sets, are the open neighborhoods, the open delta ball around x0 and the open epsilon ball around f of x0. So here is an open set definition of continuous function that is purely topological. It's not the only way to get at a topological notion of continuity, though. And in the next video, we're going to see an even more flexible, maybe, uh, way to define what it means for a continuous function, not involving open sets, but involving sequences of points.
So this one's going to feel a little bit more like analysis just because we think so much about sequences in real analysis. Um, but it's going to have a lot of uses in contexts where this definition might be a little bit harder to use and vice versa. So let's take a look in the next video at how continuous functions interact with sequences of points.